pick up where we left off last time. Remember, our task here is to calculate, determine the fade margin. And the fade margin is against the rain thing. Last, last time, we talked about how do you characterize the rain. And we, saw, we said that there are two principal ways. One is climate regions, and the other is the rain exceedance curves. It's just two different sources essentially telling you the same information. For any given latitude and longitude, both of these would give you a percentage of the rain rate exceeded over a certain percentage of time. If I say, essentially they give you CCDF curves. If you can specify the threshold, let's say 1% of the time, and it will tell you in 1% of the time over average year, the, this location has a rain rate that exceeds this, uh, this value. Now, the problem with satellite links is uh, they are not at any given location. They go over, over large distances, over many locations. So we have to actually find a way how to utilize this to predict uh, terrain attenuation and, and, and the given reliability threshold. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And the lecture is kind of relatively short. It's going to consist in three parts. I'm going to show you how, what the approach is go quickly through uh, the equations. And then essentially, the way how we do this in engineering practice is we standardize on the methodology. And the standardized methodology is published as ITUR specification 618-9 is the one that I'm using for, the, for this class. And we'll go through the equations. I'll explain the thinking behind the equations. They are not always physical equations. They are a lot of times empirically derived to fit the data that was observed and measured, right? So not everything there is going to have a distinct physical meaning, but you will look at them and they will make the sense. And then at the end, I will show you how, uh, where the document is, and I would invite you to read the document. It's one of the many documents that you're going to be reading if you're doing ITU documents, if you're doing a satellite design work. And then what uh, I also supplied with the class a spreadsheet that implements this particular calculation. So, and then we'll spend some time me explaining how to work with the spreadsheet, and we'll look at some examples to see what happens if you if you try to achieve thresholds to, so that you can get uh, reliability thresholds at different frequencies, so that you can get some idea about what these fade margins, how large they need to be. Right. So those are the things that we're going to cover here. Now, the central concept here. There are, as, as I said the last time, there are two parts to calculation of the rain, uh, rain attenuation. First one is calculating something that's called specific attenuation, saying how many dBs do you lose in your signal per linear distance of the propagation through the medium, which is the, which is the air in this case, or atmosphere in this case. Now, I want you to pay close attention here. We have you know, encountered the propagation losses before, right? We, talked about free space path loss, you know, ever since the beginning of this class. The nature of the free space path loss, you don't really have a loss of signal, so to speak. The reason why you receive uh, less, uh, ever smaller uh, energy is because the signal energy gets dispersed over larger and larger sphere. So the nature of this loss is power, right? It depends as a power of the distance, right? It's d squared law because you don't have any any other obstacles in between transmitter and receiver. But in general, when you talk about environmental losses, they go with a d to the power, right? Of two in free space, d to the power of, of three, four in terrestrial environment propagation and so on. This loss here you have, so that means 20 dBs per decade, right? So uh, linear as a function of the log of distance. Here, the, the distance, the loss, is a linear function of the distance itself. This indicates a different type of loss, right? If, you're, if something is a linear function of the distance in a, in a logarithmic domain, that means the signal decays exponentially, right? So when you have something that decays exponentially, then it becomes linear in a logarithmic domain. So here the loss is different. The, the, the signal decays as a function of the, in dBs, 
experience losses in dBs as a function of the linear distance of the propagation. The nature of this loss is different. The, the majority of the, of the loss occurs because either absorption of the energy by, the, by whatever is in the, uh, in the air or the scatter of the energy throughout, throughout the environment. Right? But uh, here, the, the nature of this loss, the, the nature of loss is completely different. Now, <laughs> how do we approximate loss? We say that the loss due to the rain is going to be specific attenuation, which is the number that we're going to calculate, and then L effective. L effective is something that is called effective path through the rain. If you have, uh, let's say, propagating from here to here, then along the along the uh, path, the rain will experience different rates, right? So if you calculate your specific attenuation for a given point, the specific attenuation really changes along the way. Right, because the rain rate changes along the way. We have done a lot of experiments, and uh, there is a way how we go about this. You know, uh, in, a, in a calculation, you will see we calculate something that's called effective length of the path, which is not the actual path, but this is the length of the path that will give you the same loss when applied to this particular uh, uh, specific attenuation as if you were traveling through the real path. Most of the time, this effective path is uh, a little bit, uh, well, I should say that, you know, it can be either larger or smaller than the actual physical path. And uh, we will see how you do the calculations. So, how do we, uh, how do we uh, do perform these calculations? First step is going to be determine the specific attenuation for the ring for a given link. And then the second part, we're going to determine the, the effective path. So how do we determine specific attenuation? Experimentally, it has been determined that the specific attenuation has this format here, right? And they give it as a function of the rain rate. Now, uh, in, uh, in ITR 839, that's another specification that I, I put on the website, it talks about uh, this particular equation, where it comes from, and how to use it. The, the way how it works is you do all the calculations for R001 reliability. So that's a, that's a 0.01% uh, reliability. And then there is a way how you extrapolate to other reliabilities that are required. So this is a 4 nines, right, reliability. And then you say, well, there is a way how you can extend this either to, let's say, five nine, six nines, or the other, the other direction too. Uh, however, when, when it comes to very end, I'll point that, that these extrapolation equations are valid for range of probabilities, not for any any probabilities. We'll see that, that they're they're valid up to five percent. Now, specific attenuation depends on uh, rain rate at a given uh, reliability threshold here, and the two uh, constants, k and alpha, that's the uh, one that uh, are used in your book. A lot of times, you will, you will find this coefficient, k and, and alpha being a and b. A lot of microwave books in particular refer to the same constants as a, b, a, and d. And also, they carry uh, subscripts, as you can see in this table here, that are either h or v. What, uh, what we see here is that uh, the losses depend on a, on a polarization of your wave, right? And, uh, and, uh, and in uh, uh, particular, your, uh, what does it say here? Your, your uh, horizontal polarization seems to be a thing in the right? right? So these values are larger, so alpha is always larger, slightly larger for the horizontal polarization. However, the the effect is mild. It's not as a, as, a, as, a, as a function of the polarization. You can see that uh, that uh, uh, these coefficients, which is not no, not completely, should be converted. Let me make sure. Yeah, because it is the combination of the two. So you see, this this is no, is it, no, it's, it's it's what it is, right? So it's, it seems like horizontal polarization is more effective. The, the, so you see that there is a dependence on frequency and a dependence on polarization as well. 
So if I if I uh, know, for example, frequency of operation, and I know what kind of polarization is being used, then you can calculate the specific attenuation given the range length. So if I say, if here's an example, calculate the specific attenuation at 10 gigahertz and rainfall of 40 millimeters per hour, right? then uh, and vertical polarization is used. So here, I, I don't have it uh, spelled out, but let's just uh, do the calculation, show how these calculations will be done. So your specific attenuation, gamma r, is going to be k, what polarization? k vertical, r, 0.01%, to the alpha vertical. You're going to read k vertical from here. For 10 gigahertz, this is 0 0.00887, 0 0.00887. Times the rain rate 40, and then times alpha for vertical polarization, so it's 1.64. And this gives us, I guess, 0 0.94 dB per kilometer. So you're going to lose 1 dB for every kilometer that you, that you track. Okay? So that takes care of the first part of the specific attenuation. The second part is your effective length. And effective length is calculated based on this kind of uh, diagram. This, 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 is, this uh, is covered in a ITUR 618. Um, um, there, is, there is dash and then there is a year for the specification. I think the latest one might be uh, nine, that's the one that I was using for the notes, but it's always good to check. They modify them slightly, whereas as the new data are available and new studies are being done. This approach is uh, semi-empirical, which means that uh, it is motivated by physics, but it's really fitting the data, right? You have the way how all of these studies are done, you launch a satellite that part of its mission is to send a beacon signal that you at a given frequency and even uh, intensity, and then you observe that signal at different places around the globe under different weather conditions. And you catalog this data, and then somebody sits down and does the study and fits and, and determines these kind of equations. So what are the, what is the objective here? You can easily detect your physical path, right? You, 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 that's, that's not an issue, it's just a geometry. But what is the equivalent path that when multiplied with specific attenuation gives you the proper, proper uh, loss? And that's a statistical quantity that depends on the following uh, inputs. It depends on what is your rain rate at a given location. What is the height above mean sea level for the Earth, uh, Earth station? So how far above the mean sea level your Earth station is uh, located? Theta is the elevation angle. We saw that this uh, uh, elevation, uh, phi is the altitude, how far from the equator is the Earth station. R is the effective radius of the Earth. We typically use what is called radio Earth, which uh, takes into account the fact that the radio waves bend as they propagate around the Earth. So that, uh, that uh, kind of can be modeled as if the Earth is slightly larger than what it is, that the Earth curvature is small, right? that the radius is large. And, it <coughs> and the frequency of operation. So all of these are all, all of these are, are inputs. A couple of reference things here. You know, if you if you when you climb up, your uh, what starts as a water vapor here eventually condenses and freezes into ice. And then you have what you're really looking for is to determine this what is called precipitation height, this height here between, uh, between uh, B and C. Above B, you have the rain in the clouds, and then at C is where it starts falling down. Right? So where is the height of this? This depends very much on the latitude of, your, of your, uh, where your Earth station is. The closer to the equator is these are low down in the atmosphere. So now, if you go to, let me show you that um, recommendation. 
this is uh, this is the document that I have posted there. It's uh, uh, I guess it's six eighteen dash eight. There, there is dash nine. I don't know what the differences are. And then what this one does, it kind of gives you ten different steps that you need to go through in your calculations to calculate what your effective path is. So I'm gonna you know there's a little bit. Uh, Science here, but mostly it's just uh, explaining the algorithm. So I'm going to go ahead and do, 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 do these explanations. So first thing that uh, that you need to determine is the height of the rain. Essentially, how high is this this uh, threshold between B and C region? And these are the equations that are that are uh, that are given. You know, for phi here is your uh, your altitude, and then uh, uh, so you just if you know your altitude, you just plug it in here, and uh, and you get the height of the of that ring. And we have for the northern and southern hemisphere. So you need to know the latitude at which your earth station is to know at what typically at what height the rain starts to fall. Then the next thing is to compute the slant path below the rain height. So essentially how long is the path uh, from your earth station to where it pierces through that layer that, that uh, delineates the, where, where the rain starts from. Most of the satellite links, you know, out of these two equations, this one is really rarely used because most of the satellite links have their theta larger than five degrees. You, you, tend to not operate within a 10 degrees of the horizon because there, there's a chances of blockage there and it's very difficult to, to get a clear line of sight to a satellite. So most of the satellites are 10, even 20 degrees uh, above the horizon. So most of the time you're going to use this equation here. HR and HS are referencing to the, to the figure that you have on the previous slide. So HR prime minus Hs, Hr prime is the height, and Hs is the, the height above the mean sea level. So that's the bottom of where your, your earth, station, uh, is, uh, earth station is located. So if the earth station is, you know, tells you uh, the distance between this layer and the height of, the, uh, of, your, of your earth station. So that divided by uh, by the sine of theta obviously gives you this LS the, 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 of the triangle, which is the length, physical length of the path, right? But not everywhere along the path you're going to have the same, you're going to say the same intensity. So that path needs to be now transformed in what is called effective path. So we need to do corrections on that. How do you do corrections? Well, there's a, first we start by looking at calculate the horizontal projection so this is just that they were projected to the ground then in a step number four you obtain the rain rate for that region uh, the rain rate can be obtained either from uh, local data or from standard exceedance curves or from climate maps if you have a local knowledge then that's preferred of everything else a lot of these earth stations they collect you know also uh, the, uh, meteorological data for that specific location. So over time, <coughs> if you have a station that's operating, you don't have to you don't have to resort to these standard curves. But when you're putting the station for the first time, there is no history there, or you have to rely on the, on the climate maps or the exceedance curves. Then, once you know the rain rate and you use the then based on a uh, 838. Uh, recommendation, which is the table that I gave you with coefficients k and alpha, we can calculate specific attenuation. So this calculates specific attenuation. And then we have uh, two reduction factors that transform this Lg into, effective, into an effective path. The first one is your horizontal reduction factor that uh, depends on your you know, frequency and your specific attenuation and so on in this equation, which obviously has no physical meaning. It's just a fit to the data, right? And um, then you have your vertical uh, adjustment factor, which is even more complex. You know, you calculate this side first, and then you plug that, you know, into.
to this equation here. So, so it takes a little bit, a little bit of patience to go through all these equations to uh, to uh, be valid. But you calculate this, and then if it's greater than theta, you use this equation. If it's smaller than theta, you use this equation. And once you have LR, then it plugs in here, and then these this this psi is obtained from uh, as, a, as a function of the amplitude of the air station. Obviously, coming from a history of uh, of measurements taken in, in many different locations, many different altitudes. And then, in the next step, uh, your effective path is now corrected for the vertical, so you get your effective path, and so that. That's the part of the end of the second part. In the first part, we calculated gamma r specific attenuation. Now we have an effective path, and then we predicted the attenuation in four ninths case, 0.01% of the time, is going to be product of the two. Right? This is now attenuation in dB for the total path. This is in dB per kilometer. This is in kilometers. Uh, when you multiply the two, you get the total dB. Now, this whole calculation is done for, as I mentioned, for the reliability of the four nines. What if your design requires different reliability threshold, five nines or, or three nines or whatever may be the case? Well, you have a way here to adjust that, and you adjust that by calculating this beta first, and uh, when P is greater than 1% or by P smaller than 1% and so on, otherwise you have like an if statement and then once you determine what your beta is, then you can adjust this by what, calculating whatever was the attenuation that you obtained for 0.01%. This is the probability that you're, that you're shooting for, the reliability that you're shooting for, and then this complex equation here that you should always double check uh, you know, to make sure that you copy it correctly. But, but in theory, what, what this does, it allows you to translate the losses that you're going to experience in 0.01% uh, uh, of the time to other percentages. So if I know, if I want to uh, get the losses for 0.001% of the time, then P would be 0.01, and I would execute this, and I would get the different, different number. The smaller P is, means that your reliability is larger, your losses are going to be larger, right? So if your loss is at 0.01% at by 10 dB, losses at 0.001% might be 16 dB or larger, right? So because that's a more rare event that you're going to exceed these particular losses. Any questions here? This is spelled out in your book as well. And uh, uh, I also uh, did some work uh, some time ago where I actually had to code all of this. So I don't know if you can just explain to you how this is also posted for, for you to, to do the problems and it kind of implements this whole procedure. So the way how the spreadsheet works, here is here are your inputs. Usually, you know, just like any other spreadsheet that I gave you, what whatever is is in red, those are the, the calculated values. You shouldn't type one on the top of them, right? And usually my inputs are blue. So inputs are freely chosen and they would, based on what your inputs are, things are gonna be recalculated. Uh, recalculated. Blacks are, are the ones that are not inputs but are just, uh, you know, calculations that, uh, that you have to do along the way. So here's how you design a link. You stress, can you see it or is it too, it's too small? Huh? Let me go first to the input section. This, can you see this now? All right. So here are the inputs. You're going to specify what is your operating frequency. What is the frequency of the loop, right? Then you're going to say which climate region I am in, right? This is based on the climate map. Climate map. So you're going to find out I'm designing here for Melbourne, so I specify M. What is your height above sea level? How high is your earth station above the sea level? We are almost at the sea level here, so a relatively a small number. This is wrong, we're at 28, but this is somewhere a little bit north of us. 
So then you specify latitude of the Earth station. Remember, that comes as a part of the calculations too, right? Uh, then you have specified the elevation, which is the angle uh, from the horizon. How, how, uh, how is the satellite antenna being pointed? This is effective Earth radius. This is four thirds of the actual Earth radius because we're talking about the radio Earth. So the Earth radius is slightly larger. <coughs> then polarization, if you enter here one, it's for horizontal, two for vertical polarization. And then what is the percentage of, of that you are, of the, of the year that you're shooting for? Here I have a relatively large threshold, I guess I'll just So let's uh, uh, look for, uh, let's say, 0.01%. So 0.01% uh, uh, is approximately a little bit less than one hour a year. So that means that this link is going to be in outage approximately one hour in an in a average average year. So these are your inputs. Now, what is part of this spreadsheet? Here you have your climate zones, and these are the rain rates at this threshold that we do all our calculations at 0.01%. These are the rain rates. Remember, there are 50 times of uh, not times, 50 climate zones throughout this entire globe. We here are in the time of N, or close between N and N. Okay. And uh, so that's the first uh, piece of data that we need. And then what you have to the right-hand side here of you is is the table that uh, that contains <coughs> KVs, Ks, and As for this calculation of the specific attenuation. Black ones are the ones that uh, are provided with uh, with the specification itself. Now the red ones are the ones that are obtained by interpolation, and because uh, uh, the, the specification itself they give you these numbers, but they also give you the method how to interpolate if your operating frequency is not tabulated in the table. How to, and, and you give you the specification: one is linear in the linear domain, and the other one is uh, linear in the linear domain. There's there's an algorithm that they give you how you interpolate in between the points. So this gives, a, gives me all the coefficients that I require for calculating all the specific attenuation. <coughs> and then when you go to the right, is, this is, this is uh, your algorithm, right? So these are the steps. In this particular step, you know, you calculate height of the rain, right? Where is that boundary between regions B and C, right? Then the length of the slant path, right? That's the, that's the the height difference divided by the sine of theta, sine of your sine of your elevation angle. Then horizontal projection. Then you grab the for a given for a given rain uh, uh, for a given climate region. You grab the rain rate for uh, 0.01 percent of time. Then you for a given uh, for a given frequency and polarization. You're going to determine your k and a. And then here it gives you your specific attenuation. So specific attenuation, remember, I'm calculating this for 30 gigahertz, right? <coughs> Look how large this number is. 30 gigahertz is very sensitive to the rain. The higher you go in frequency, more and more sensitive you become. So here you're almost losing 16 dB for every kilometer of the rain at, at 30 gigahertz. That's why, that's why uh, when you when you go higher up in frequency. You know, requiring very high reliabilities to give you an unrealistic fade, fade margin it would be like a, you will see that the, you, you, the power requirement and antenna and all of these things will quickly get out of hand. Now there are those complicated equations for horizontal and vertical reduction. So that's what is uh, done here: 0 0.5 and 118. So the effective path is 418. In this case, it's just slightly smaller than a physical path, right? And uh, so the rain attenuation look 6638 dB, right? So can I get that kind of reliability of 30 gigahertz at this latitude, to this climate? No, this is unrealistic. You know, this, is, this is huge, right? So, uh, so then what I do is I go revise, right? It's okay. Cannot get anything like that. 
see, because I, I did all the calculations at 0.01, this number here and this number are the same. There is no adjustment for different probabilities, right? So let's adjust this. Let's say, well, how would I design this link? But let's uh, let's uh, reduce my requirement and say I want 1% reliability. This will give me outage of 87 hours for a given or a given yeah. year. Let's see what kind of margin I need to deploy there. This is a realistic margin, right? So it's about A D B of margin. So if I'm able to incorporate A D B of margin, this would give me a 1% reliability of the thing. It will work 99 99% of the time. Right? So this is how you can you can uh, 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 do your trade-offs. Now let's let's just look at for a sake of reference. Let's change the frequency. Let's go down. Let's go <coughs> to our C band, six gigahertz, and let's look at what happens if I require now 0.01 reliability. Right? That's that under one hour of outage time. It does all the calculation. Look how small the margin is here, two dB. Right? So as 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 you move lower in the frequency band. Then, then uh, your signal becomes more and more unaffected by rain. Right? It will, it will uh, be able to penetrate the rain better. But as you move to these new bands, then, uh, then you have to live with a certain, uh, certain, uh, uh, certain reliability. Right? You cannot really push it to, to a very high degree of reliability. This is slightly different than in the microwave links. In microwave links, First, they're not uh, this long, right? They don't uh, uh, they don't go thousands of kilometers. They go a few kilometers, but uh, you will do similar calculations there. But uh, you can achieve much higher reliabilities because the, the antennas are closer, and you can have a hefty margins of 20, 30 meters. But in uh, satellite, you've seen that. Uh, the, the thing is very, very far, and, and every dB counts. Okay. Is there a way to make a smart system so that if I needed to provide um, a better reliability, I just boost the power at that when the rain is really bad? That is that is power control. And that's one of the one. There, there are two uh, two approaches to that, right? Uh, in, in, in general, right? One is, um, uh, I guess, two degrees of freedom, how you can do your adaptivity. One is the one that you suggest. This one is, okay, have a Swiss system that realizes that the link is suffering and then pump up its power, right? And then, uh, then to overcome it. So that system would have adaptive power control. Systems like that operate, and, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that approach. There's an alternative approach, which, uh, which is more appropriate for database services. And this approach is what is called adaptive rate control. Right? And what, that, uh, what, uh, what those systems do, they maintain the power at the highest level that the system can sustain. So in, in a good, in a good uh, propagation conditions, your margin is large. But then you trade this margin for an increase in data, right? So what happens is you say I have a great margin, let's say 20 dBs, let me switch to 16 quant. And what it does, it, it allows you to pump a lot of data through the system. Now let's say it starts raining, all of a sudden there are losses and your, and your margin starts going down. And at let's say 12 dB you say, oh I cannot support 64 quant now, let me go to 16 quant. And then a few dBs, Later, later you go to QPSK, and then eventually, if, if you have a very heavy rain, that your link transitions to, uh, to just the VPSK. Uh, that's a better way, because what you do, you experience the performance degradation, but the link stays on hold. Right? And that's related to uh, shorter channel gap, the gamma, right? That's, that's exactly what that theorem tells you, right? That, uh, that your your rate data rate is uh, is uh, uh, proportional to achievable spectral efficiency is proportional to the 
to the log of one plus in optimization. And it's funny that you mentioned that because I can only see you which one. Oh, look at this. Because the, the project I was using this for, I was actually evaluating that very same thing. And uh, uh, if I can remember how this, I added this, but let me see if I remember. So here's another input here. If I say, okay, I designed my link to have 6 dB of, of, uh, of uh, average SNR in a clear air, and then with this strain rate faded margin, 169, then uh, my spectral efficiency can be 1.89 bits per second, right? How, how do you determine that? Your uh, signal to noise ratio that, that comes in the clear air, so SNR clear air is 6 dB, which is this linear uh, 3.98. And then uh, your fade margin is fade margin that at this particular uh, reliability is 1.69 dB which is this 1.47 linear. So your system <coughs> uh, needs to be designed, if it is no adaptation, it needs to be designed to operate uh, with the data rates that are uh, relying on a signal to noise ratio 6 minus 169, which is 431 dB. So that's the signal to noise ratio that you can that you can, that you, that, that will determine the data rate that you can communicate. Why? Because this is the, this is the uh, signal to noise ratio that you want to protect. You want to say, if I have this signal to noise ratio, my, my system operates. So that gives you the limit on the data rate. If you have a better, it's fine, right? When you have worse than the, than the link, uh, the link uh, uh, gets broken. So now, if you have 4.31 dB, what is this in linear? Can you see? So this is 2.69. And then your spectral efficiency, which is defined as a C over W, which is your LD of 1 plus SNR. And in this case, this becomes LD of 1 to 69. And let me calculate this and see if, uh, if that's what I'm calculating here. So this would be equal to log 2 of this. <coughs> this plus 1 base 2. So this is 1.89 bits per hertz, right? Bits per hertz. So if I, oh, that's, that's this, obviously this number here, my efficiency that I can, if I, if I design my system to operate with this level of reliability. So this is the highest efficiency I can have, right? And what that means, if I'm operating a 36 megahertz transponder, then I can count on a throughput that caps at 68 megabits per second. I cannot get more than that, right? Because uh, to get more than that, uh, this is even pushing, right? Because this is assuming that you're right at the Shannon's limit. So comfortably, you can operate like 50 megabits per second or something low. If you need more than that, then you have to go in two ways, right? Either you increase your link budget where you provide higher signal to noise ratio, or you say, okay, I'm not gonna not gonna yet be able to provide at the same level of reliability, I'm gonna provide it to the lower reliability threshold, right? And uh, that's where your adaptivity really plays an important role because you can design for for the best one and then as the <laughs> and that one is true most of the time because most of the time it doesn't rain right? or it doesn't rain really hard. But then as, as it rains really hard, your system adapts and the rate goes down to a different different modulation scheme. This spectral efficiency comes down, but your link still stays up. Right? So instead of 
having a little before 17 people to stream, now it's 7 people that stream to the rain. Okay. Sections so, that people that don't get anything, right? Yeah, or, or, or performance degrades for all 17, right? so some of them give up and go do other stuff. So, uh, so that's that's pretty much it. I mean, this is this was a big big part of that link budget link budget uh, calculations that we did last time. That was a missing piece. Remember, we had all the gains and losses, but we always assume what the fade margin is. Now you have tools here <coughs> that will allow you to calculate what that fade margin is, depending on how many miles of your your link. Yeah, that's it. Unless there are any questions. Okay, so this this is on the, on the website. This the spreadsheet. And, uh, this we have. Let me just just uh, do some process check. We have one more lecture, and then and then test, right? Review, right? So review, no, review, review. Oh yeah, then then review and then test. Right? I'm, I'm mixing it up with the other classes where it's all review. So. Today <coughs> is the end of this week, so we have a lecture on Tuesday, a review on Thursday, and the following Tuesdays. April 1st. April 1st. April 1st. April 1st.